Hello lovely people! This week I'm going to talk about my favourite non-fiction book for 2021. I can't remember if I put this disclaimer in the last video, but I should say that these are just books that I read in 2021, they are not all 2021 releases. Shall we dive into it? Sophie Vlogs! The first book for my not favourite non-fiction books was actually the first book that I finished in 2021, and that was Being Human by Judith Human, which is Judith Human's memoir. Um, she is a disability rights activist in America, and this is her memoir about um, her childhood, her life growing up, but also the um, activism that she was involved with. She was vital in passing, um, I think it's the... I can't remember the name of the legislation in America because I am not American. The, um, it's, but it was this massive key piece of legislation to do with disability rights that she was absolutely key in getting through. And just um, she's just a fascinating person. I thought that her memoir was eminently readable. She has achieved some wonderful things. And I, I read it on a whim because it was on Libby. And so I just thought, oh, I'll give that a go. And actually, it was such a great way to start the year. And it was like a five-star read out of the gates. Another book that I absolutely adored last year was Midnight Chicken and Other Recipes Worth Living For by Ella Risbridger. To give you a sense of how much I adored this, my friend gave this to me, to me for Christmas, so I read it in January, and then I reread it in April, which is very soon for me to do a reread. This is food writing. Um, it's essentially essays, but with lots of recipes interspersed. So a lot of this is a cookbook, and I have used this a lot. The um, cookie recipe from this has been so popular with people in my life, but I've made a lot of the other recipes as well. But I just think that she writes so beautifully. Essentially, she ended up writing this during an extremely difficult part of her life. This deals with loss, um, and some of her essays are like heartbreakingly beautiful and really bearing in mind you know pandemic life has been full of ups and downs genuinely helped me through certain parts um she has another book coming out in 2022 that is sort of the follow-up that is um looking at how she then because this was written during a, an extremely hard time in her life that ended up resulting in a loss and then her next book is looking at how she pieced herself back together after that so i just think that this is one of my most important pieces of food writing slash writing in general. Sometimes I just dip back in and read certain essays that I need to read. Um, and I just think it's beautiful and lovely and I love it with my whole heart. A book that I have actually lent out to someone, <laughs> that's how much I liked it, was uh, Trans Love, which is an anthology edited by Freya Benson. This is an anthology of um, trans and non-binary writers and I think one cis contributor. Um, essentially challenging this idea that coming out as trans will um, mean, means that you are unlovable or that you will have difficulties finding love in its many forms and it's it's really um, at its core being like no all trans people are worthy of love and can achieve love and it's it's looking at love in all of its permutations this is not just about romantic love it's also about familial love friendship um, and it is just a whole plethora of contributors just writing pieces about whatever spoke to them. It is it is um, organised by sort of like type of love, so you get like different sections exploring different types of love, but um, I just thought it was a beautifully well put together collection. I have lent it out, which is always a good sign. <laughs> After that is No Logo by Naomi Klein. This was published in, I believe, the 90s or early 2000s. Early 2000s, about 2000. Um, so in some ways it's like a little bit outdated, but also like depressingly prophetic because Naomi Klein is really looking at the way that, like, um, brands kind of, like, or, like, companies kind of moved from being companies who produced things, like, we make shoes, to becoming brands that put their logo on things. So it's looking at that evolution, how that kind of came to be, but it's also doing a real deep dive into, like, labour practices around the world and how like outsourcing things gives brands the ability to um, distance themselves from accountability when stuff goes wrong. It's looking at a lot of exploitation in like the supply chains for things. It's looking at advertising and like how like that murky whole world. It is doing so much and I took a, I took a while to read this to make sure that I was really taking in everything that she was saying. And I've definitely forgotten things that she said, but it has really stayed with me. And 
some of the it's interesting because some of the brands she talks about in this are not really brands that exist anymore but some of them you're like oh you're still doing those things and then you know with with companies like Amazon and stuff like this they've just like taken some of the stuff she's talking about and then just gone like even further with it into being terrible <laughs> so this is definitely like not always an easy read but I think that this was a really um, extremely well put together like she is predicting things with great astuteness and it has really like changed the way that I view consumption um, in like a really positive way and I'm really trying to do a lot better <laughs> Um, so this is one that I would definitely recommend if you are interested in any of those topics. So just, just then the, I'm not going through these in any order, I'm just picking them up as they are piled, which means we're bouncing around topic wildly. But next is Spirals in Time, The Secret Life and Curious Afterlife of Seashells by Helen Scales. I picked this up on a whim on a secondhand charity shop, and I'm so glad I did because it was utterly fascinating. Like, this is everything to do with shells. It is to do with the creatures that make shells, how shells are made, underwater beings, but also like the role of shells in culture. Like um, cultures that used shells instead of currency, like iconography we have to do with shells. Just anything you could think of to do with a shell is covered in this. Um, but it's it's extremely like accessibly written because I'm not a very like scientific minded person and frankly, I didn't know anything about any of these things. Um, and I just found it fascinating. Like, mollusks are so weird, hermit crabs are adorable, these are my takeaways. I just found this brilliant in like one of those delightful surprising ways when you kind of go in not knowing what to expect and then you come away and you're like wow mind blown a book that i read on my kindle was catherine the great by robert k massey this was a chunky biography of catherine the great um but i like i read it right at the end of the year i read it in december 2020 2021 god time <laughs> um but i just found it like immersive and really extremely well done like i also have read the romanovs by Simon of bag montefiore and i found that really frustrating because the man just put so many footnotes in that were unnecessary whereas um captain the great i just felt like like i was really walked through it in a way like he gave a lot of um information that i needed to make sense of the context of her actions information on like her as an individual as well as her as like this political figure and monarch um i've just i never felt like i was lost at any point occasionally like sometimes i was like um you've already told me this little bit before but on the whole like it's so big and i i felt like i had like when i was going into it i was like god am i just going to be lost but actually i've come away with a real sense of who catherine the great was like i understand more about her policies, why she had them, her as an individual, how she changed. Like, she initially was quite a progressive figure, and she was communicating with all of these philosophers, like Voltaire, but then as her reign went on, and especially as stuff like the French Revolution happened, which really, like, shook her to her core, because her entire power rests on her being, like, the monarch, um, then she becomes much more of a, like, a conservative figure. Like, all of these things, like, I, I have come away and I really feel like I have a much better sense of this figure and why she was so important, how she got the power she had, how she used the power that she had. Um, I definitely would be interested in reading more of Robert K. Massey's work. I know he has done a number of, I think there are four in total, he's done one on, like, Peter the Great, Nicholas Ale and Alexandra, stuff like that, so... I found his writing really engaging and I will definitely, I think, be reading more of his biographies because my Russian history knowledge is limited, <laughs> but this I found extremely helpful um, and I like, kind of sped through it for such a chunky little book. Another kind of history book is Left Bank, Art, Passion and the Rebirth of Paris 1940-1950 to by Agnes Poirier. We're essentially, we're focused on Paris, we're focused a lot on a lot of like figures to do with like the surrealism movement, um, just to give you some some names, like Simone de Beauvoir, James Baldwin, um, Miles Davis, Arthur Kostler, like all this kind of stuff, like these people who are like iconic, but also that I would say that I didn't really know much about. Um, what I didn't really particularly liked about this was not just learning about these figures and these movements that I didn't know a lot about, but I felt like the way it was told was really great. So. Um, it kind of is a narrative. Sometimes history books just like give you like facts and figures and we're making a historical argument. This one kind of I felt like had almost like a not like a fictional element to it but the way I was walked through things felt like I was reading a narrative. I don't know if that makes any sense. 
but um, I just thought it was really engagingly written. There were so many names floating around in this, and at no point did I feel lost. I always felt grounded, and I always like understood who we were talking about, which I think is an achievement because she does cover a lot of different figures. Um, this was a gift from my friend Mark, so thank you very much, Mark. I found it absolutely fascinating. A book that was lent to me by my friend is Word Slut, A Feminist Guide to Taking Back the English Language by Amanda Montell. This is kind of what it says on the tin. It's like a linguistics look, and it's looking at a lot of things to do with the English language. Just to give you some examples, it has stuff to do with... Oh, one of the chapters that I loved the most of this was to do with um, languages that have genders. Who decides what gender things are? How do you go about degendering language that is inherently gendered? That was a fascinating chapter. Um, there was another chapter to do with like insults, like gendered insults and swear words, which was really interesting. I just, this was also very inclusively done. She has a whole chapter that is acknowledging like, um, gender is more complex than masculine and feminine, let's look at that in language, like that kind of thing. Um, it was, it's very light, it's a very accessible book, it's not like a heavy linguistic tome, it's very much going for like um, a lighter vibe, making it as accessible to audiences as possible, that kind of thing. Um, but I just had a really fun time reading it. A book that absolutely dazzled me, and is just a top read of all time now, is Pandora's Jar, Women in the Greek Myths by Natalie Haynes. I read this for Nonfiction November, it was the first book I read for Nonfiction November, it just set me off for such a good month, and now I adore Natalie Haynes and I need to read everything else she's ever written. This is looking at women in Greek myths, um, it goes through different women like Clytemnestra, Helen, Pandora, it is looking at, um, okay, these ideas we have of these women, like, how much is that accurate to what our actual sources said? How much of these are ideas that have developed over time based on, like, translators and the other cultures that, like, or, like, time periods and how, like, morality of different time periods has been, like, put upon these women? Um, it was just, it reminded me, it was like being back at university and having like a beautiful classical studies lecture that I walk out of and just, I'm like enthused about everything. Because I think I took a small break from doing classical reading because I just, I reached a point where I was like, this kind of reminds me of being at university, I'm going to take a small break. But this has kind of rejuvenated me and now I have a bunch of like classical retellings and stuff because I'm like back on the train. A book that my partner lent me is I Saw Ramallah by Maura Barghouti, which is translated by Adas Suez, um, which is beautiful. It's um, this poet's return to Palestine. Um, he, his brother never got to return, so there's like this, this haunting kind of throughout this where he's kind of always thinking about how his brother would have felt to have been returning. There's also this element of he is re he's having a homecoming by returning to the place that he is from, that he's been exiled from, but also he is a bit of an outsider because he has not been here for this time, his experiences are different. Um, this, this sense of displacement that he has when he's not in Palestine because he is not in his home, but then this sense of displacement upon returning home and finding that home has been changed beyond all recognition. Um, obviously this, this hits differently having read it in 2021 with a lot of the um, Israel-Palestine conflict that kind of um, came to much more of a global awareness at that point. Um, I just think that it was beautifully told, almost like stream of consciousness, and I'm not always good with stream of consciousness, but this was done in a way that you just always feel the immediacy of his feelings, like, um, he's not, he's, he's describing to you his journey, but you always understand how he is feeling, and I just, uh, he's a poet, and then the translator is an artist, and there is this, like, lyricism in the way that it is told, um, I just thought it was beautiful, I would really, really recommend. Just to change genre again, wildly, sorry. <laughs> this is Two Truth Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee on memory migration in Taiwan. This is kind of nature writing because Jessica J. Lee is um, looking at Taiwan, which is where her family is originally from. And, um, well, her family initially moved from China to Taiwan and then from Taiwan to Canada, and then she also spent some time in the UK. Her experience of returning to Taiwan, the physicality of it, describing it to you, like, in, in a myriad of ways, like there's different different sections tie into sort of different like elements or stuff. So there's like a whole section where we're looking at the the tectonic movements and and like the the earth of Taiwan versus then like the section where we look at like 
botany and Taiwan's botanical history and that kind of thing. Um, but also like on memory migration and Taiwan, she's also looking at um, her mother returning and how her mother's reaction is to returning to this place. Um, her grandfather, she's, she's recently lost her grandparents um, her grandfather had um, dementia, so there is this element with memory that is to do with um, forgetting things, remembering things. Her mother goes to Taiwan and her mother uh, is initially disorientated because she can't, like, everything's changed, but then she finds the, those bits that you find where, where suddenly you remember where you are and you can orientate yourself and all that kind of thing. So I did post a whole individual review of this, which I'll link down below. Um, I just thought that this was, it, it made me reflect and I read it in about springtime because I remember the blossom coming out while I was reading it and I found reading it like a really peaceful experience and it made me consider a lot of things. Um, I've never been to Taiwan, <laughs> I don't really know what it's like. I really loved learning what it was like but the the ponderings upon stuff like memory and connecting to those generations and then what it's like when you lose connection with those generations stuff like that I just it made me think about a whole lot of stuff a book that I read on Libby was Disfigured by Amanda Leduc which is a collection of essays where she is looking at disability in fairy tales and she's she's looking at fairy tales but also um she takes it through to a much more like contemporary point where she also looks at stuff like superhero movies as like modern fairy tales and all like how disability is represented in those. Um, this was one of those that I just, I felt like every every time she like talked about these things I would be like, you, you know you have those realisation moments where you're like, how did I never even notice this before? How did I ever consider this before? Um, in a very complimentary way there is like an overlap between like um, things she discusses in this book and things that, um, for example, Jen Campbell has done videos on. Um, and I say that as a way to sort of say, if you like Jen Campbell's video discussions on um, disability and disfigurement and how they relate to fairy tale and that kind of thing, then I think you will really also like this collection of essays. And it is on my radar because of Jen Campbell, who spoke highly of it. Um, but yeah, it was uh, a really interesting move through from like traditional fairy tales to then looking at um, fairy tale adaptations, but then also stuff to do with like Marvel and superhero and that kind of thing. Okay, we're on to the final three. <laughs> Just to do another, my final piece of nature writing is Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, I'm obsessed with moss now, <laughs> and this was everything I wanted. Robin Wall Kimmerer is uh, a botanist. You will probably know Braiding Sweetgrass, which is um, her collection of essays where she uses like blends like scientific knowledge with her like indigenous way of approaching the land, um, which is beautiful. I think I read that in 2020 and I think that was a 2020 favourite. This is um, all about mosses. Uh, it's another series of essays. In some ways I found this one to be ever so slightly more like, I don't know a better way of saying this, scientific, insofar as we had more like diagrams of mosses and because we were focused wholly on moss rather than on like nature and the world in general I got a real understanding of how moss actually what moss is made up of like how moss works and functions as a being which was fascinating I loved this so much um it's just absolutely like what I will definitely return to and read again I have learned so much I just think that moss are fascinating beings that I wish, like this is the only moss book I know and if you have any moss book recommendations I'd really love to hear them because I want to know more <laughs> about moss. My penultimate book is a chunky one. This is The Last Free Raphaelite, Edward Byrne Jones and the Victorian Imagination by Fiona McCarthy. I have previously read Fiona McCarthy's book on William Morris and I loved it. Edward Byrne Jones was a member of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood that I knew less about. I am very familiar with a lot of his paintings because I have been fortunate enough to, I love the Pre-Raphaelites, so like, <laughs> I've gone and I've seen them in different places, but I didn't really know much about him. And I mean, it's big, it's a beast, but it's a beast because she goes into it in like really wonderful depth. I have come away with a much better sense of who he is as, an, as a man, um, what he is like as an artist, the different influences he has. In, in objectively, like he had a bit of a, like his role in regards to the Free Raphaelite Brotherhood was an interesting one because he was potentially one of the more like, socially like he, I don't know like he he had all these different connections 
and I just, I can't even sum everything up. This was exactly as complex as I wanted it to be without being so complex that I was like boggled all the time. I understand his process of creating better, I understand um, he lived longer, I think, partly as well than some of the other pre raphaelite members. So he got to experience times of history that some of the others didn't and then responded to them. Like that was fascinating, how that influenced his artwork and the themes he drew upon. Um, I, I went into this being like, oh, I like Edward Ben Jones, but like he always does the same face, which I guess you could also say for like Rossetti. So, you know, um, but I've come out of it. I don't necessarily like him as a human being, but I find him fascinating and I have a much more wider appreciation for his work and a more in-depth knowledge of his influences and all of that kind of thing. It was wonderful. I loved it. <laughs> but I loved all of these. Um, my final book is Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, a biomythography by Audre Lorde. This is Audre Lorde's um, autobiography about living in Harlem in the 50s. Um, it was, number one, Audre Lorde writes beautifully. Her, she's a poet, and you can tell when you read her work, it is beautifully written. But also, um, this snapshot of life in the 50s in Harlem, um, her as a gay woman and being part of that scene, but also um, as one of the only black women. So she had a very different experience than other women would have had, and a lot of the time the other women didn't always understand that, and they would be like, we're all the same, because we're all gay, and then she'd be like, however, I also have this, like, other <laughs> experiences that you don't have. Um, I just thought it was beautifully written, it was just a joy to read, and I loved it. <laughs> I've run out of steam, so I'm going to stop, but those were like my favourite non-fiction books that I read in 2021. It was really hard to narrow it down because I read some really, really great books. Um, I would really like to hear, if you have read these, I would also really like to hear what your favourite non-fiction books were that you read in 2021. Um, I think about, I, I keep trying to make it so that about half of my reading is non-fiction. I think I got just under that in 2021. Um, we'll see if I can rectify that and make that more even in, I think I, had, I think I had about a third of my books were non-fiction in 2021, which is good and I'm happy with, but um, doing this and going through and assessing what my favourite reads were made me realise like how much quality non-fiction I read last year and I would like to carry that onwards. Um, but yes, I hope you have a really nice day, I will see you next time for something different and yes.